In fact, a very clear new role. As you move towards a third, I mean, remember what a third world society looks like. Uh, a third world society has a lot of superfluous people. People are just useless. They have no human rights and no human value because they don't contribute to making profit and enriching the rich. You know, they don't even clean their floors. They're not even needed for anything. They, well, uh, in, a, in one of our third world domains, that's why we fund security forces. Like we, half of our military aid, more than half for Latin America goes to Colombia. And the reason is it has the worst human rights record on, in the hemisphere. It slaughtered the security forces have killed maybe 20,000 people or so in the last few years, you know, political organizers and union leaders and uh, peasants and so on. Uh, and that's the way you make sure you keep the superfluous people under control, you slaughter them. Well, we haven't quite reached that level here, though we're getting to be a third world society. Uh, so what we do with the superfluous people, the ones who don't contribute to wealth production for the rich, and therefore have no, don't, aren't human really, uh, what you do with them is first of all try to coop them up in slums, which are sort of like concentration camps, uh, and if that doesn't work, you put them in jail, uh, which is the equivalent, sort of the counterpart in a wealthy society to death squads in a poor society. Uh, and so they're naturally zooming. Uh, and they are a shot in the arm. And certainly crime is not going up, at least as far as any evidence is concerned. I mean, if you can believe the government, you know, FBI statistics and all this other stuff, crime is fairly level, you know. I mean, it sort of went up in the 70s since then. It's probably, according to them, it's even declined. But the perception of crime has increased, but that's because it's, uh, it's not that it's not a serious problem, especially if you're a poor person. It's an extremely serious problem because crime is mostly poor people preying on each other. So you're a poor person, you know, living down in Roxbury. Yeah, crime's a problem, but they're not the ones who are calling for more prisons, you know, uh, the, to, to put, you know, their own sons in jail. Uh, the, uh, in fact, there are now more black males in the prison system than in the education system in the, you know, relevant ages. Uh, in fact, what the criminal system is simply being used as a war against, uh, literally a war against an unwanted part of the population. Uh, a part of the population that used to be industrial workers, or at least have the opportunity to, and maybe work themselves up, but now just have no rights, because you don't need that anymore. You can get them cheaper somewhere else. Uh, so you've got to get rid of them. Uh, that's a large part of what the drug war is about. The drug war has no effect on drugs. In fact, as I mentioned, a large part of and it's well known outside the United States, as in the Bishop's statement, that a large part of the drug policies are fomenting the production of drugs. Uh, and in fact, if anybody wanted to do, do something about the drugs, they'd go to wherever those uh, $260 billion of annual profits are being laundered, namely U.S. banks. You, know, you don't see many bankers in jail. Uh, the drug program is designed and implemented to criminalize an unwanted population, black males, Hispanic males, and so on. So you, know, you, you take a look at the chain gangs in Alabama, and it'll be somebody who had a joint in his pocket, you know, that sort of thing. So that's what you do with it. Uh, as for the, uh, the system has a side benefit. It's state spending, uh, so it has a stimulative effect on the economy. Uh, uh, firms like, say, Merrill Lynch, you know, and, and Prudential and so on, uh, they are uh, uh, putting out bonds, tax-free bonds, uh, for the building of prisons and making a lot of money on it. Uh, it's a growth, it's part of the, it's, it's part of the growth system, you know, it's, kind of, it's not the scale of the Pentagon, but it's sort of, you know, it got the same function. Uh, in fact, the military corporations are, all, like Lockheed and so on, they're already realizing it. So they are now exploring the possibility of um, entering on, you know, climbing on that gravy train and selling, developing high-tech high -tech, high -tech methods of surveillance and control which the public will pay for, and it'll be dual-use technology, and you'll be able to use it for something else. Actually, there's a big story in the Wall Street Journal about it a couple months ago. Uh, so, you know, you can, you're a good engineer. You can figure out a way to implant an electrode in somebody, so then some supercomputer somewhere will have them under surveillance, and if they go the wrong place, you send out a shock or, you know, drug, you know, chemicals or something or other. And that way you could have very efficient monitoring of, and control of large parts of the population, which would be quite cost effective, except of course for the technology which the public is paying for anyway. Uh, prison construction alone is a booming industry. And the security personnel has been, maybe still is, the fastest growing white collar operation for some, uh, you know, profession for some years. Uh, so all of this stuff goes on with you know, pouring money into the hands of the wealthier sectors, Merrill Lynch, uh, construction. Also, the prisons are being privatized. 
I don't remember the figures, but the growth of the privately run prisons is far higher than the state run prisons. And that's just another scam. Uh, privatized prisons is like privatized health, it means the public pays the costs in one or another technique, but there's private profit, uh, and you have a lot of techniques of, you know, you can cut down costs by pour, putting more prisoners into a cell, and you don't have to give them any care and uh, you know, no rehabilitation, none of that stuff. So I, I think the whole thing is, is a very natural consequence of the policies designed to create a third world type society. Now when I say third world, I don't mean the United States is going to look like Mexico, you know, much too rich for that. But it, it's going to that structure, you know, that kind of structure at, at a richer level. And yeah, that's, uh, prisons are part of that, just as death squads and the, the terror of the security forces is part of Mexico and Colombia. There isn't and could not be an objective fact of an act so th that was intrinsically evil, uh, uh, objectively so, so that uh, it, it was not uh, a matter of our uh, a matter available to, uh, responsible to our attitudes towards it. That, that seems to me a, a remnant of a pre-modern way uh, of thinking. Sir, so, that phrase, available to our attitudes, do you mean it's evaluatable under them, or do you mean forgivable? That is to say, viewable as something that, you know, all right, this is, this is in conformity with well, something that we accept. penetratable by them, changeable by uh, our attitudes. Um, I mean, Hegel is in, I see it's a Pollyannish view, he's in, uh, the Leibnizian tradition, everything's for the best in this best of all possible worlds. Uh, in Kant, this becomes a regulative uh, ideal. Well, that's, that's the way we should uh, think about it. In Hegel, it becomes the object of a commitment, uh, uh, an obligation to uh, acknowledge a responsibility to make that so. Uh, and uh, this carefully crafted, crafted notion of uh, recollective rationality, what he thinks of as um, reasons march through history. Uh, you know, the world we get is not rational as it comes to us, but if you look on the world with rational eyes, the world will look rationally back. How do you do that? You do that by telling these uh, recollective uh, rationalizing stories. And he doesn't see a limit in principle to that uh, and, and wouldn't allow the idea that it could just be an objective fact that there were things that were impenetrable, uh, impenetrable to that. Uh, maybe there's a feature of the world that he's overlooking there, but uh, I, I do find the, the commitment that he's summoning us to uh, an attractive one. I mean, you also uh, asked whether this wasn't a, a view that infantilized those who are forgiven. Uh, Hegel notoriously has uh, a hard to motivate view of punishment as uh, something the community positively owes to the miscreant. Uh, the, the miscreant has uh, uh, attempted to um, flee the recognitive community, is trying not to adopt practical attitudes of recognizing other people's authority or responsibility, and the community says, no, we, we still recognize you. We, uh, you you're, you're still one of us, uh, and, and argues that the punishment is uh, the form that recognition needs to take. It says, no, no, you can't uh, reject moral community with us. Now, maybe that's uh, an unintuitive or infantilizing sort of view. Well, why shouldn't he if he wants to reject recognition uh, with us? You know, in the end, well, it's because you can talk. You know, if you can talk, you really are one of us. We do have uh, obligation to you. Again, that's a, that 
sort of universalizing is a, is a kind of... Um, Would such punishment be forgiveness on your scheme? It, it depends on what you mean by punishment. Uh, I'm locking. I'm locking. forgiveness. Uh, you know, is the guy in jail? Uh, no, lo locking someone in a cage can't be uh, recognizing them as one of us. That's oh. treating someone as an animal rather than as uh, one of us. The, uh, I mean, what you get is your reparative responsibility. Well, that's. Uh, uh, all right, we, we've got to mitigate the effects of what you did. But the recollective one, too, is to incorporate it into uh, a progressive understanding of what we're all doing um, and uh, what the connection is between that and uh, traditional notions of punishment. And that's not something I have a story uh, about. This is sort of the background that, together with some other premises, leads Hegel to that uh, way of thinking about, uh, about punishment. Uh, I mean, I think this leads to a reparative, restorative, well, a recollective uh, theory of maybe not punishment, but of forgiveness.